Well, Kathy's sitting down, so it must be time to start. <laughs> At any rate, we know it's that time. <laughs> Didn't mean to hurt your feelings, run y'all. <laughs> well, it is time to get started. I welcome everybody. Uh, one of those nights that you would like to have wrapped a blanket around your shoulders and watched it rain outside. So I appreciate you being here. It wasn't the easy choice, but it was the best choice because we get to be together and we get to study God's word and we get to worship him tonight. So let's do that. We begin our quarter, a new quarter, as we study the book of Ezekiel. I'm looking forward to it because I have never taught in a public classroom, public Bible class, the book of Ezekiel. So I'm going to be learning right along with you. This is going to be fun. So let's uh, begin with prayer. Ask Brother, Brother John to lead us in prayer. So let's bow as he does that. Our Father in heaven, as we prepare to enter this study period this evening, we are thankful, Father, for your guidance. We're thankful for this your word, that we might be able to consider it, understand it. We pray that you will give us that understanding that we need in order to more fully comprehend and, and accept our responsibilities as your children. We ask that you be with Steve this evening as he guides our thoughts. We pray that you would be with each of us so that we might have receptive and understanding hearts. And this evening, as we consider all of these things, we want to petition you with our request that you be with those who have special needs this evening, whether they be physical or, or otherwise. We pray, Father, that you would be with those who have those needs. If there are things that we might be able to assist with we pray that you will give us the guidance and the insights that we need in order to identify that we ask father that you continue to be with us strengthen us keep us always aware of our responsibilities and the things that we should be looking for and aware of we pray father that you forgive us of our shortcomings or the times when we fall short and sin. We ask that you continue to guide us and forgive us of those things. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I'm not sure if they've got a, a shorter preacher hired coming in or what, but uh, I'll, I'll try to do the best I can to uh, read my notes. I know some people probably do well with this distance, you know, right here. I prefer a little bit closer. The good news is it's going to be right up here too, so we can all see. And the even better news is that we've got uh, replacement projectors on the way. It's going to be a process of changing some things over for the technology people. And I won't even begin to try to explain it. But that's going to be happening soon, and when it does... We're going to have some really good uh, pictures up there because these now are over eight years old. And I don't know why a machine wears out, but they do. So they're, they're getting a little wear on them. We look forward to that. Money? Now, Kendall, you're not saying people manufacture those to wear out, are you? <laughs> I, I say amen. Yeah. Amen. Anyway, we're looking forward to that when that happens. In the meantime, let's do the best we can, and we can see it a little bit here to uh, consider what we're doing. As you study the Old Testament prophets, really as you study any book, but especially the prophets, and we've been doing several of those lately, it's really important to understand where in the history of Bible times uh, their writings take place. What, what is the situation around them to help to understand what they say in the things which they write? Uh-oh, it didn't work. I shouldn't have pressed it twice. So we want to do that again. 
as we've seen charts like this before, that give us on a time frame, as we think about the activities of God's people, when something was going on. Now, we've been studying, Ken has been studying with you the book of Jeremiah, and so we see Jeremiah's rather lengthy ministry there. At the top, you see the years, 620 B.C., 610, 600, all the way down to 560 to sort of help cover what we have tonight. We're talking about Ezekiel. And those kings up there, uh, Josiah and, uh, and all the others, uh, they were kings during this time of, of Jeremiah's ministry. And you talked about those in the book of Jeremiah as the study progressed. And then we have Babylonian captivity up there, which doesn't show up very well. Probably would have been good to have another color, but you see what we're talking about at least afterwards. Well, as you can see, we've got Ezekiel right here. Now, Ezekiel would have been growing up during the time of Jeremiah. And although we don't have comments to indicate that, we would have every reason to think that he probably knew a lot about Jeremiah, the prophet, and the way that he prophesied. And when you look at the style of Ezekiel, we assume that even though God sent his message through these inspired men, they still had their personalities, they still had their styles uh, that were, at least in some cases, uh, individual to them. It almost looked like Ezekiel may have learned from Jeremiah as far as his style, uh, a little bit of what some would call outlandish. And in fact, Ezekiel probably, most people would say, exceeded Jeremiah in what some folks call outlandish in his presentation of God's word. He really was fighting to get people's attention with the way that he taught. Notice that it wasn't too far back before Josiah, who was the, the last righteous king, had his reform. So Ezekiel would have been very familiar with that. It wouldn't have happened too long before. And of course, we see Ezekiel and his ministry taking place during the lifetime of Daniel, while Daniel was where? In Babylon. And that's where Ezekiel is going to be headed for. We'll see the timing on that in just a moment. But as we look at the outline in just a moment of the book and we talk about the events that take place in Ezekiel's ministry, the warnings that he gave and the prophecies that he made, uh, we want to be able to put them in a time frame here. Notice, if you will, that uh, <clears throat> Jerusalem and the temple destroyed right here Follow down the timeline here, you know, right here. And we find that Ezekiel was aware of that. In fact, it was a time that, cha uh, that, that changed Ezekiel's life. We'll get to that in a moment, too, at the same time. So Ezekiel is, is familiar with what's going on, with God's people being warned through Jeremiah and other prophets, and with Daniel in the first bunch of captives that went to Babylon. And then, of course, he himself eventually going to Babylon in exile. So this is, this is kind of a feel for where we are now, and that'll help us to appreciate the things that Ezekiel, with uh, God's urging, of course, has to say. Uh, by the way, just in case anybody's curious, Joe and Obadiah, they're the two prophets that we have the least evidence to put them in a time slot. That's why they have question marks there. You know, we, we look at what they said, and we think, well, there, there's several time periods that could fit, and there's just no way to even guess at dating them uh, other than just kind of put them up there right, like that and put the question mark saying we're not going to be dogmatic about this. Okay, another chart here for us that uh, I think it's hopefully large enough for most folks to see, and this is a, a great big broad division of the book of Ezekiel. This will help us as we go through it to have a feel for what's going on. Beginning with the first verse, going through chapter 24, it's about God's judgment on Judah. 
And then 25 through 32, it's about God's judgments on these other nations. Now, what do all these other nations have in common? In that second column right there, Ammon, Moab, Edom, the Philistines. So what do they have in common? Why would God be punishing them? They were perennial enemies of God's people. They, they just were. And occasionally there'd be a time of peace or, or, or God's people would subdue them for a period of time. But uh, when it came time for them to be punished because they departed from God, these nations took advantage of that and did it in a very cruel way and were not true to them. You know, Egypt was going to be their ally, and they weren't much of an ally. It's just, uh, you know, the reason they were punished is because God punishes injustice, whether it be his people who leave him or whether it be another nation who is you know, doing those things which are unrighteous. So uh, the first part is about punishment. As you see at the bottom there, it's characterized as a message of judgment. This is what Ezekiel is saying is going to happen to these people. And it's not unlike many of the things that you talked about when Ken taught the book of Jeremiah. Because a number of the Old Testament prophets were talking about the same thing that was coming. Ezekiel has the somewhat unique situation of having been there before, and then be taken into exile too. So he kind of overlaps the events there. Okay, if you look at verse 1 of chapter 33, and you go through the end of chapter 48, it's called the oracles of salvation. If you look down at the bottom, it's called the message of restoration. Now, another way that this has been characterized by the scholars is this. At first there, we have doom because everything that was going to happen had not happened yet to God's people. Remember, Jeremiah said, you know, you, you, you think you've broken your yoke of, of wood, but now you're going to have a yoke of iron, or even worse, even more powerful to bind you. So uh, bad things, the, the worst was yet to come. And there's a message of doom. Okay, and they call this other side here uh, a message of hope because God's enemies are going to be punished in those chapters there. We're going to read about that. And then there's a hope for the future. And remember, that hope would, would lie not in an immediate end to captivity. That's what false prophets would say. That hope lie in the restoration of a remnant of God's people 70 years later, and then eventually, and this is the biggest hope of all, of course, because it's our hope too, in the Messiah and the coming of his kingdom, the church. So this was a message of hope. First 24 chapters, message of doom, punishment. The last four, God's justice would be, would be carried out, and God's people would be restored, and God's plan to have his son die for the world is going to continue through the seed of Abraham, just like he said it would. So that's a nice broad way of characterizing Ezekiel. And uh, when you get to these cutoff points, you'll know it. And when God goes from telling Judah to Ezekiel, here's what's going to happen to you yet, and he moves on to here's what's going to happen to your enemies, and then he starts with a message of hope. That's the big three categories. At first, a message of doom. And then later on, a message of something to look forward to, a message of hope. Let me think if I want to say anything more about that. Oh, yes. <clears throat> I wanted to talk a little bit about apocalyptic language. We're not going to talk a lot, about, a lot about it now. We're just simply going to introduce the idea because as we come upon it, we'll talk about it more then. But there are a number of Old Testament books, the prophets particularly, and of course the book of Revelation and the New Testament, which deals with apocalyptic language. And the word apocalyptic comes from uh, 
a Greek word, you know, the, a New Testament sort of word, but it, even though the style is used in the Old Testament, it means to reveal, to reveal something. Hence the name of our New Testament book, Revelation, because something's going to be revealed. It's going to be revealed in a, by way of, of symbols and figures and uh, uh, imagery. This stands for this. This isn't what it appears to be. You have to look for the meanings of these symbols. Uh, just like in Ezekiel 33, one of the most, if you ask for somebody, one of the most commonly known scenes from the book of Isaiah, of Ezekiel, by the way, if I start saying Isaiah, somebody, hold him. stop, you're saying Isaiah, okay? Or any other prophet's name. Make me stick to Ezekiel. Uh, if you say, what's the most prominent story you remember from the book of Ezekiel? I think a lot of people would probably say, well, you know, Ezekiel 37, when God said, Ezekiel, you see that valley full of dead people's bones right there, dried out, whitewashed by the sun? Go there and preach to them. And he does. And as he does, the flesh, the sinew, the muscle, everything starts coming back on them. And God says, preach to them some more. And then breath comes into them until instead of a valley of dry bones, it's a valley of people. Well, of course, the literal part of that means very, very little, but it represented God's people. You know, lying in exile, uh, a form of enslavement in, in Babylon, they were like those dead bones. And you look at those and you say, well, that represents the Jewish people. Man, I don't know how God is ever going to restore them and, and bring the Messiah into the world. I think he's going to have to change plans. This doesn't look very promising. Well, those dead bones didn't either. But he was showing Isaiah and anybody else that was told about it, this is what God's going to do. It's going to be like miraculous by taking bones and turning that into people. He was going to restore God's people. That's the kind of language, the imagery, uh, the symbolism that we have in Ezekiel in a number of cases. So we want to remember apocalyptic language, and it's very vivid. It's very memorable. You know, you hear a story like that, and, you know, you, you hear that as a little kid in Sunday school. Man, I remember that. I don't think I'll ever forget that story as long as it got in my mind. That's a vivid story. A bunch of bones come turning into people. You remember this. And also, at least if you are God's faithful, when you hear an apocalyptic message, you say, praise the Lord, because it, it means hope to me if God's going to do this. If God's going to do this, that means, well, if, I, if I'm righteous to him, that's a good message for me. So it could bring hope as well. So apocalyptic language, we'll note that a little bit as we go through and if we see situations that involve it. This, as it always is, is too small, but it's, it's uh, Nelson's Bible Dictionary um, outline of the book of Ezekiel. And I can print this off for anybody like to have one, if you'd like to have one a little more detailed. If you just want to remember those two and three categories we had at the beginning, you know, that's pretty good too. This is much more detailed here as we talk about, as we see about the various judgments. Of course, the first few chapters have to do with Ezekiel's call, first three chapters. They're not really part of the doom. Uh, basically, God is calling Ezekiel. And then we have the judgment coming on Judah. Remember, remember the northern kingdom's long gone, taken to Assyria, disappeared, never to reappear uh, years before this. So it's Judah we're talking about and various uh, judgments that will come upon them in ways that Ezekiel is illustrating this judgment to them. Very memorable, very clear ways of what was going to happen yet. And then the judgments on all the people, as we saw a while ago. And then finally, the restoration, the hope that was coming. So if anybody wants a copy of this, it's, it's a slide. I can print it off very easily if you would like one that is a little more detailed. Okay. Because Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel do have this overlap, it's kind of good to compare them, see where they are here, and what their purpose was, and some of these things that are, that, are, that are compared here in this chart. For instance, Jeremiah, his ministry began when Josiah was king. If everything had stayed like it was when Josiah was, was king, 
what would have been the future of God's people? It would have been bright. No reason for Babylon to come because Josiah was, you know, just time after time. It seemed like he reached a certain age. He said, I'm going to handle this. He got a little bit older. I'm going to handle this. And before you knew it, he'd reestablished the right kind of worship to God and gotten rid of the idols. You know, at least for as long as he was around, it didn't last long enough. All right, Ezekiel, his ministry, that's who we're studying now, began in the second deportation. I've got a chart of the three deportations in a moment, the three times that Babylon came and took people from Jerusalem and Judea, Judah and took them in exile to Babylon. It happened in three different waves. You'll see that in a moment. And then Daniel, his ministry began with the first deportation. So he's already in Babylon, you know, by the time Ezekiel and a number of the other craftsmen and so forth get there. Okay, Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet, Ezekiel the prophet of hope, because what he ends up with is, is the idea of, uh, well, there's some good things coming, because God has this plan called the scheme of redemption. And then Daniel, prophet of the nations, he's sometimes called. First two, focusing upon the land. Daniel, focusing upon the nations. Um, Jeremiah, prophesied to the Jews, Jerusalem. Ezekiel, to the Jews by the river Kibar. And then Daniel to the Chaldeans in Babylon. He was, he was there in the, the king's service. And he was an example and perhaps did as much by his example as he did by any kind of teaching and prophesying, although he was a prophet. Okay, Jeremiah writes from Jerusalem. Both of these write from Mesopotamia or Babylon, from the captivity, both Ezekiel and Daniel. And then uh, the other comparison, Ezekiel mentions Daniel three times. We'll have a verse on that in a moment. And then uh, Daniel also mentions Jeremiah. There's no reason to think that, that all, you know, all three of these folks didn't know about each other, and perhaps very well. And then finally, uh, Jeremiah's, for the most part, his ministry, although the book was written afterwards, of course, ends with the fall of Jerusalem. Ezekiel ends with a vision of a future temple there in the last chapters. And uh, Daniel ends with a promise of future resurrection. So a little bit of comparison to those three prophets that were contemporaries. The name Ezekiel means God is a God strengthens or God gives strength, or there's various ways to say that, but that's what the, the Hebrew name means. It, it, it's a sense that, you know, God gives you strength. It's an interesting name for the message and say that it sometimes Ezekiel had to give because he had to remind these folks who thought the power was within them that it was not. I have just a couple of examples here. The same phrase is used. And first of all, in Ezekiel 30, he's talking to the nation of Egypt and refers to her arrogant strength. And her arrogant strength shall cease in her. She's going to be overrun by Babylon just like everybody else was. And then in Ezekiel 33, it's, it's, it's a re reference to God's people. I will make the land most desolate. Her arrogant strength shall cease. So, it's a case of whether they were God's people or whether they were the nations round about. They were looking for the wrong source of power. They were looking to themselves. And of course, you remember Judah looked to, to these other nations, allied themselves and said, we'll get enough people helping us. We can defeat Babylon. Well, they couldn't. For one reason, it was God's plan that they did not. Because of disobedience, God planned what Babylon did. He allowed that to happen. He orchestrated it. So uh, they were arrogant in their own strength. That was going to cease, whether it be those people in the middle column we saw, all those nations, or whether it be God's people. So God strengthens. Everybody else, they've got arrogant strength, and it's not going to be effective when the challenge comes. Okay, another little chart here that shows the deportations, the three times or three waves of the taking of exiles to Babylon. As you see, there were a few years between each one. The first wave, the first deportation, 605 or 606, somewhere around there, uh, on, on these uh, dates, we, we give a little bit of, of uh, leeway. Jehoiakim was left in power by Nebuchadnezzar. He took the sons of nobility, including Daniel, taken hostage. They started at the top, you know, because 
rulers back then tended to surround themselves with the best minds they could get. And it didn't matter if those, those minds came from another country or whatever. They wanted the best they could get. They wanted smart, uh, attractive, powerful men to, to work for the good of the empire. Well, Daniel was one of those. Remember, he and his, he and his buddies wouldn't eat the king's food. They just ate, just ate the plain food and, and drank water. And they did better than, than, than everybody else that was being prepared to serve the king. Daniel came over in the first wave about 605 when Babylon came and took people away from Jerusalem in exile. Okay, the second deportation, 597 B.C., Jehoiakim and Jeconiah both deposed and Zedekiah placed on his throne. And of course, Zedekiah didn't turn out too well either, as we remember from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, they came back, they took the nobility, the warriors, and the craftsmen. And Ezekiel seems to be something of nobility, although he was also a priest. But he seems to be, uh, they, they believe that he came through, although it can't be proven, all the way back to Zadok, who was the, the true high priest, the priestly family back during Solomon's time, who could trace his lineage all the way back to Aaron and his, and his offspring. So in other words, he was the one who was supposed to be the high priest. They think that Ezra and his father, who we'll mention, see his name in a minute, were probably well-to-do people. So they, this second time, they take back some well-to-do people get rid of the kings that weren't faith, loyal to them and put another one in his place. He wasn't going to be loyal very long either. He was going to try to get all these other countries to say, let's put our armies together and we'll put a stop to Babylon, the Babylonian Empire, and it didn't work. And then, of course, there's the third deportation, the third way, 586. This, this was, you might say, the killer. This is the one that we talked about in Jeremiah. We saw in Lamentations that Jeremiah perhaps sat there as he wrote the book and wept tears as he watched the ruins of Jerusalem, perhaps still smoldering. It was, it was destroyed. And Zedekiah was deposed. Uh, they, he left a governor in, in charge of things. And Zedekiah watched his sons be killed and had his eyes put out and then was taken back in slavery. All the inhabitants of Jerusalem and surrounding areas taken. Anybody that was anybody. They left just those that <laughs> nobody wanted them. They can have what's left of Judah. We don't, we don't even want them in Babylon. They're not even worth taking. So three waves of deportation. And Ezekiel, the fellow we're talking about tonight, wasn't a prophet yet. He was in that second wave of about 10,000 people who were taken to Babylon uh, to stay there. Remember, he'd grown up knowing what Josiah had done. He grew up probably watching Jeremiah do some of his teaching, some of his, some of his attention getting behavior. He was taken into captivity. We want to talk about some frequent phrases in Ezekiel because some things are, are repeated over and over. This next one, son of man, 92 times. Bear in mind, I did not count these, so please don't start counting through your Bible to see if I've got this right. I took this from someone who is, you know, dependable and should have counted correctly. So this should be close. And, of course, 92 times. I believe, and I haven't checked this, but I believe I've read somewhere that uh, of all the characters in the Old Testament, he's the one who is most often called Son of Man, given that, that uh, identification uh, in the text. So 92 times, that's number one. A sword is mentioned 84 times. Now, if you read about a sword, and, well, you shall know that I'm Lord 64 times, blood 50 times. Let me ask you, if you read, if you know that a book is going to mention the word sword 84 times, the word blood 50 times, what do you think the nature of that book is probably going to be before you even pick it up? <laughs> yeah, punishment. What do you think God's going to be saying to his people? Well, you're great people. You are really pleasing me. You're worshiping well. You're living well. I like what you're doing. Commendation. No, you don't even expect that if you know that this is in a book uh, this many times, and that's the truth. It wasn't a book of commendation. As we saw, it was a book of doom uh, for a big part of it. Abominations are mentioned 44 times. The Lord doesn't, doesn't like abominations, does he? Idols mentioned 37 times. The phrase, as I live, is mentioned 16 times. 
rebellious is a word used 15 times, which occurred to God's people way too much. My name, as in God's name, my name shall be spoken. My name means this 12 times. And then the glory of the Lord is mentioned 11 times. So if you, if you had just a kind of little concept about Old Testament writing, and you said, and you, you weren't told what book it was, you look at this and you say, man, I see some apocalyptic events coming up here. I see some really powerful, judging, uh, painful events taking place in this book. Just some all the phrases that are used there. And of course, that's what the book of Ezekiel is. Okay, let's talk a little bit about Ezekiel. By the way, very few people, there's all, you can never say nobody because there's always somebody that argues with any Bible statements you make, okay? There's just enough people out there. There's enough people that call themselves scholars and students of the Bible that they'll argue with anything. But most people do not question that Ezekiel was the one who wrote this. He self-identifies it, you know, several times in the book. Uh, he, he writes as one who, who saw this. Now, uh, where the argumentation sometimes comes in, it sounds like he's in Jerusalem seeing things. Well, if you're a prophet of God, even though you're in, you're in Babylon, can you know what's going on in, in Jerusalem? Sure you can. You know, because God knows what's going on in Jerusalem. And if he's chosen you to be his prophet, then you can know what's going on too. So we see it's still, you know, he is, as far as his knowledge, his, his recognition, he's transported back to Jerusalem to see what's going on there, even though he's still in Babylon and his message is to the folks there. And that's kind of part of the apocalyptic nature too. Okay, and he carried into captivity all Jerusalem. This is comes from 2 Kings 24, 14. Gives us a little uh, insight, and this is when Ezekiel was taken. All the captains, the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives. This is, this is the group that, that Ezekiel marched to Babylon with. And all the craftsmen and smiths, none remained except the poorest people of the land. And Ezekiel was 25 years old when this happened. Uh, we could we could go to the different scriptures, and we could uh, show how we know his age at each time. But we spend the whole night doing that with scriptures. Okay, it's it's a little bit complicated, so we're not going to do that. But uh, he was 25, he was a relatively young man when he was taken to captivity, and a man of promise, a man of some substance. There is why he was taken. Okay, we continue with his his growth. Now he he wasn't when he was taken. He wasn't a prophet yet. It came to pass in the 30th year. And most people agree that means Ezekiel was 30 years old. Sometimes he identifies his age. Sometimes he identifies how long they've been in captivity. As I was among the captives by the river Kibar, that the heavens were open and I saw visions of God. That's his, that's his call. That's Ezekiel being called to be God's prophet uh, while he was already in Babylon as a captive. Okay, the river Kibar, by the way, is believed to not really have been a, a true river, but rather a huge canal that joined the Tigris and Euphrates River. And if you remember your, your, your maps of Babylon and uh, the cradle of civilization, if you studied that in, in school and geography, uh, two, the two major rivers there, the Tigris and Euphrates in the Fertile Crescent, well, they, they had, the Babylonians had quite a, a canal system and one of the biggest canals was Kibar. So it probably was not a natural river. It was probably something that had been dug out, more like a canal that joined those two major rivers. But this is where apparently uh, many, perhaps most of the Jews settled, of uh, this 10,000 when they were taken back. And that's where Ezekiel sits and sees some of his visions sometimes and does some of his writing perhaps. Okay, which was in the fifth year of King Jehoiakim's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of, and uh, let me think about it now, Boozy. Okay, it's like you say, that's a doozy, except you put a B on. That's a Boozy. His dad's name was Boozy, and he was a priest in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Kibar. And the hand of the Lord was upon him there. So this is the call of Ezekiel when he was 30 years old. He'd been in exile in Babylon for five years. So what it had been like in Jerusalem, 
and he knew he was exiled, and he knew what it was like to be a captive in Babylon. Okay. It came to pass in the 27th year, in the first month, on the first day of the month, that the word of the Lord came to me saying, and this marks the beginning of the end of his ministry, as far as we know. It is what's recorded and what's dated in Ezekiel 29. And that runs us up to about 8, uh, BC, 570 BC. So 592 to 570, about 22 years that he was a prophet to God's people who were in Babylon. And it's generally believed and I'm not sure what, what sort of proof. It certainly isn't uh, absolutely firm, but they believe probably he died in the year uh, 570 B.C. at the end of his ministry. So that's kind of the, the chronology of Ezekiel the man there as he was doing that. Now, here's an interesting and a sad part of the life of Ezekiel in chapter 24. Again, in the ninth year, in the tenth month, on the tenth day of the month, the word of the Lord came to me saying, okay, so he's in the, sort of in the middle, or, or early to middle part of his uh, prophesying. The word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, write down the name of the day, this very day. And I've forgotten what it was. I think it's, I think it was March 16th, according to their calendar, 586. Write this date down. The king of Babylon started his siege against Jerusalem this very day. Okay? Remember, he's sitting there hundreds of miles away on, on the banks of the river canal Kibar. Jerusalem, Babylon, the king has gone back there because they rebelled again. They refused to be uh, true to the empire. He's gone back, and this time he says, I'm going to finish it. I'm going to lay siege, and when I'm done, Jerusalem is not going to be the same. Not going to be any real city there, and there wasn't. And we talked about that when we talked about Jeremiah and Lamentations. But the very day that it started, God's prophet hundreds of miles away was told, it started. Write this down. And he did. But here's what was in association with that day. Also, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, behold, I take away from you the desire of your eyes with one stroke. You know who the desire of his eyes was? Anybody familiar with Ezekiel? You you'll know what happened. Who died that day? His wife. The desire of his eyes. She died that very day. Yet you shall neither mourn nor weep, nor shall your tears run down. Sigh in silence. Make your mourning for the dead. Bind your turban on your head and put your sandals on your feet. Do not cover your lips and do not eat man's bread of sorrow. In other words, you're not to grieve. You're not to mourn. Your wife's going to die on the same day that the siege began back in Jerusalem, 586. She's going to die, but you can't grieve about it. You can't publicly grieve about it. You've got to keep it in. So I spoke to the people in the morning. He gave his message to the people there. And at evening, my wife died. And the next morning, I did as I was commanded. In other words, I didn't put on the clothing of a mourner. You know, I didn't wear sackcloth and put ashes on my head and sit and weep and so forth. I kept doing God's will. We look at that and we think, boy, God demanded a lot of some prophets, didn't he? And he did, right? You know? He told one to go, go, go buy his unfaithful wife back out of, uh, out of slavery, didn't he? God uh, had some interesting situations that he expected his prophets to live with. But in this case, uh, he expected his, uh, Ezekiel to go forth. Now, is, is this just something there for coincidence? Is it something, uh, just a mean streak or something, or... What was God showing us? What was God showing his people? He was showing God's people. God was showing his people how much somebody can hurt. How much somebody can hurt when they are when they face a loss. What did God face? He faced the loss of his people. The people that he nurtured ever since they left Egypt. And now 
because of, he demanded justice. He had allowed them to go into Babylonian captivity. And he was hurting. God was hurting. This is, this is the way of showing us, showing the people then, uh, how God felt in, in the best terms that we can understand. You see, we, we have to anthropomorphize God. We have to make him giving human traits to appreciate how he feels when we do something. So we think, boy, that hurt God bad. And Ezekiel, he, he demonstrates that for us. He illustrates for, it, for us there because he lost the, the apple of his eye, the, the desire of your eyes. He lost her on the same day that the sea started. Okay, here is how bad off, how wicked Judah still was. Now, think about this with me. If you had already seen some of your people taken into captivity to Babylon, do you think it might be time for a national time of repentance? The people might straighten up and say, oh, we've got to live right or God will bring all this truth that he said. Maybe if we repent, he won't do it. <laughs> they didn't do that. Ezekiel says, of course, another way here that we know he knows who Daniel is, even if these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in it, that is in Judah, Jerusalem, they would deliver only themselves by their righteousness, says the Lord God. Goes on down a few verses. Or if I send pestilence into that land and pour out my fury on it in blood and cut, off from, cut it off from man and beast, even though Noah and Daniel and Job were in it, as I live, says the Lord, one of those phrases, 11 times, they would deliver neither son nor daughter. They would deliver only themselves by their righteousness. That's God through Ezekiel saying how bad, how wicked his people still were when they had already seen some of their folks, their, all their nobility dragged in chains to Babylon. And they refused. That's how bad they were. These three righteous men, they could have spent all their time preaching in the streets saying, come on, people, straighten up. God said it wouldn't have done any good. They wouldn't even stay their own family. That's how wicked it was in Judah. Okay, I think we're pretty close to the end. This is going to time out pretty well. Ezekiel's messages, if we want to sort of summarize them here, number one, the cause of the exile was sin. The people brought it upon themselves. We'll get that very clearly as we go, especially to these first 24 chapters. There would be no early return. Remember back in Jeremiah 28, I think it was, Ken, and this prophet, Hananiah, he said, oh, the Lord's told me a couple years, we're going to have this all straightened out. We're going we're gonna to defeat Babylon. Everybody's coming back. And we're going to be just like we used to be in the good old days. And, of course, he was just lying through his teeth. He wasn't a prophet of God. And a lot of people bought that, though. That's more fun to hear something like that than you're going away for 70 years. So uh, one of the things that Ezekiel says, folks, you're here for 70 years. Get used to it. God said it. It's not going to change. Even though there were prophets, even during Ezekiel's ministry, who were saying, oh, no, 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 it's, it's, it's not going to be as bad as all that. Well, it was, because God said it was going to be. And then finally, but there would be the certainty of return and restoration after the 70 years. And there were three waves then of returnees. This is there were three waves of de deportation. There were three waves of, return, waves of returnees who went back to reestablish the nation, the city, and the way of worshiping God. That's the heart of Ezekiel's messages right there. Those three things that he had to get through or tried to get through to God's people in Babylon. One final note here. Uh, as you read materials, I don't know where you get your materials, but if you get them online, you've got to really be careful. You go to the bookstore, you've got to be really careful when you buy a book about Ezekiel because there's a whole lot more material and there's a whole lot more books out there that are based on premillennialism, chapters 40 through 48, than are not based on premillennialism. So be real careful. That's, that's the way they're going to explain those chapters with the doctrine, the incorrect doctrine of premillennialism. Kendall? I think it was 92. 94, somebody? Yeah, 94. I'm not really sure. Really not sure.
No, I'd really, I'd have to think about it. It could be. Could be. To impress upon him the importance of his job. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking it possibly could have also reminded him of his humanity. But that would kind of go together there, you know, humanity, and you're, you're here working for God's humanity. Okay, appreciate everybody's attention. Didn't give you a lot of time to talk, but we'll start with Chapter 1 next week, and we've got to get through it in 11 weeks because we've got vacation Bible school. So we've got 11 weeks to go through 48 chapters. We'll do it.